How's everybody doing? Okay, I want you to, on three, repeat after me the word engage. Ready? One, two, three. Engage. One, two, three. Engage. Awesome. Here's our speaker. Give me a big hand. Thank you. It's uh, 1995. I'm 10 years old. And my mom just spent everything she had to get me this computer. And this is the best day of my life. I dial up to the internet, some of you know what that means. I dial up to my mom's university and I download MIRC. I go onto Internet Relay Chat, IRC, oh no. And I join a channel and I say, who wants to chat about the X-Files? And someone says, get out. And I didn't understand why. And I said, uh, we can chat about something else. So what, do you, what TV show do you like? And they say, you have 10 seconds to get out of this chat room. And I think my mom told me, don't tell anyone your name on the internet and don't tell them where you live. So they don't know anything about me. So I say, no, no. And this person says, you have 10 seconds to get out of this chat room. I'm like, no. 10 seconds later, the brand new computer that my mom spent everything on does this. It wasn't running CrowdStrike. This is 1995. This person just crashed my computer over the internet without knowing anything about me, and I freaked out. I'm gonna be grounded for the rest of my life. I pull all the wires out of the computer. I wait for the computer to heal, about half an hour. I plug the wires back in, and it comes up. As it's coming up, everything is okay. And while the adrenaline is still rushing through my veins, I think, that is the coolest thing ever, how do I do that? And I find this, WinNuke 95. So a single out-of-band packet will crash Windows 95. And this was super cool. I downloaded this program, and now I am an elite hacksaw. And then Microsoft released Windows Service Pack 2, which resolved this. And all of a sudden, my magical tool didn't work anymore. So how do I learn how to create WinNuke 96? And that's when I found FRAC. And FRAC is a magazine that's still going today. I believe it started in 85. And I read Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. And this just blew my mind. The simplest C program that says, hey, what is your name? You have a, allocate 100 bytes, and you say, and you type in your name. And if it doesn't check, and it just prints, hey, hello, your name, if you type over that 100 bytes, and you're not checking for 100 bytes, you can start overwriting memory, and then you can overwrite a stack pointer, and then you can point back to your, the beginning of your name, and that can be shell code, and that can execute code on the computer, and you can take over a computer with an extremely simple program. And that taught me that the way a system works is not how we think it works. Like, I want to now understand what is the ground truth? Well, how do systems actually work? How does a computer actually work? And it's only when you understand the CPU architecture and memory and how when you're uh, compiling your C code into and assembling it and linking it, how you can actually take over the system. And over time, as I've learned from many of you and from papers and from videos and just testing things, that ultimately everything boils down to energy. Like, everything is energy. Information is energy. By energy, I'm really talking, we're talking power. Energy is the capacity to do work, so to perform some type of work. Um, power is the rate at which that work is done. So for example, a horsepower. Like a horsepower is actually a unit of power. Uh, a one horsepower lifts 550 pounds in one second by one foot. Uh, I looked it up on Wikipedia. It's actually imperial horsepower. Uh, that means there's also a metric horsepower which lifts 542 pounds, slightly less. I'm not sure what we're feeding our horses. <laughs> um, probably HGH, uh, horse growth hormone. Um, so energy in power. And I realize energy is information. So if we want to actually move any information around, we have, must use energy. Uh, an example of that is we think that there's power in data, but that's not true. Power is data and data is power. If you have a USB 2.0, you plug your USB in, it doesn't work, so you plug it up the other way, it doesn't, doesn't work. The third time, it always works. When you plug that in, there are four pins. There's ground, power, and then two data, differential data. Now, the ground and power, it, there's energy moving over that. But there's also information across that. If you're plugged into a computer that's encrypting something, there's going to be some information of that encryption about the amount of power that's being, and that's going to ride on the power. Like, the power rail will actually go up and down just a little bit. That five volts will move up and down. You can measure that. And then there's the data. Well, how does the data work? Like, what is actually going across the data lines? That's a voltage. So there is actually current, 
and voltage, which is power, pushing through those data lines. So you can always extract power from this stuff. And I remember I'm sitting at my computer maybe 15 years ago, and I had these Dell speakers on my computer. And I got a text message, or I was about to get a text message, and I don't know if many of you recall that sometimes you get this interference. You get a text message or a phone call, and then your speakers go do 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 And I was like, wait, my phone's not connected to anything, yet the speakers are actually playing sound. Like, there is some sort of interference here. How, can I control that? Like, if my phone can do that, so it's not actually the cell towers, it's actually your phone trying to amplify its signal and get back to the cell tower. The cell tower is far away, so it amplifies the signal. And, that, that, and I thought, okay, well, can I open the keyboard? Can I look at how the keyboard works? And if my phone can interfere with the speaker, can my phone then interfere with the keyboard? And can I press keystrokes? So I opened up a keyboard, and it's a USB keyboard. And when you open it up, you have a circuit board that's a PCB, um, your fiberglass, and then you have all these conductors. And every conductor to, going to every key is a unique length. And they're all copper, they're all metal. Any piece of metal is an antenna. If you measure that antenna, the length of that antenna, that's a monopole antenna. That measurement is the wavelength, the resonant frequency. So you can figure out the resonant frequency of every wire going into that. And I thought, well, can I create an electromagnetic radio that can then inject keystrokes into this keyboard wirelessly? And I started to try to do this. And I started to realize that uh, it's not working. I tried a couple different software-defined radios like HackRF and the USRP B210, and I was never able to inject all the keystrokes I wanted. With one keyboard, I was able to inject a few keystrokes. And I'm like, I really just don't understand electromagnetism enough. So I started to learn about physics. And I started to learn about, well, what is electromagnetism? It's really light, um, light and radio. And uh, here's a, a, took a picture of a rainbow on a jog. And really, electromagnetism is light. Um, we can split that light up into its constituent wavelengths, and there's all sorts of other frequencies. So radio, for example, is light. Radio is just colors of light that we can't see with our eyes. And as I wanted to learn about this and how this stuff works, I started learning about light and uh, EM and radio, and I learned I need to learn physics. So I started to um, get some physics books and start reading about this stuff. One of those books was Building Scientific Apparatus. And I learned, okay, well, a lot of the people who were learning physics, which is really how hardware works and how radio works, they, are, they started by like J.J. Thompson, who broke, up, who broke the atom open. Like it's called the atom from Greek atomos, meaning indivisible. Until this dude, J.J. Thompson, put a bunch of atoms inside of a glass tube, evacuated, pulled almost everything out, put a high voltage, and then it split the atom. It was divisible. And then he used magnets and he could move the atoms the, that, that were producing light. And that became our cathode ray tube, our CRT TVs and monitors that we used. I'm like, this is super cool. I should reproduce this. So I set up a little glass blowing station at home, and I tried to, I tried to blow glass and um, do some lamp work, but all my stuff would always break. Like, I'd make something, and then it would crack. I'm like, all right, I need to actually learn some glass blowing. I took some classes in LA, uh, but these are all soft glass. And I still would come home, and I'd try to make some stuff, and it would break. Um, then I went on the internet, and I found, OK, I found this guy who makes all sorts of borosilicate glass, which is like scientific glass blowing. And I messaged him and I messaged everyone, every other scientific glass blower in Los Angeles, hey, I want you to learn how to glass blow, I will pay you. Uh, everyone said no, <laughs> like, I have a job, <laughs> you can't just come to my work. And uh, it's probably like illegal or something. So I went on LinkedIn and I searched more scientific glass blowers across the US and I just messaged everyone. Like someone has to say yes, right? Someone will take, will like let me pay them for a few hours so I can just, and I get a response from Katie. Hey, I see that you're in LA. We're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Is this something that you would travel for? So a week later I get, <laughs> Delta tickets are very cheap to Wisconsin in winter. Um, it's because it's freezing in Wisconsin in the winter. It's so cold. I show up to this place and I say, is Katie here? Uh, and an old woman answers the door and says, there's no one here by that name. I'm like, what? Did I just get pwned by someone that I reached out to? Because I put a deposit, I flew from Los Angeles to Wisconsin and I'm just standing, I'm cold, I'm uncomfortable. And the person that I paid is not here. Uh, I look at my email, we, we never contacted, we never called each other. We just like chatted on LinkedIn. And then I found her phone number, I call her. And she says, oh, I'm sorry, I switched the numbers. Fortunately, she was down the street. I walked down the street. We go into Ian's uh, glass blowing station. So Ian and Katie are these two scientific glass blowers that work for a big science company out, excuse me, in Wisconsin. And uh, I go into their shop. They show me their glass blowing lathe, their fume hood. Um, here's Ian showing me a, a 
a lighter that he made, um, Katie with her lightsaber, that's, that's fire. If you ever want to learn how to glass blow in your Wisconsin, you can email them, contact them. And I came back learning a little bit more about how to actually, uh, you wanted to pick? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted a, I came back home able to actually blow a little bit more borosilica glass, which is great. And when I came home, I was very excited and I started to reproduce some of these. Um, I made a little cathode ray tube and I started to learn more about physics and more about waves. And one of the biggest realizations, one of the most, most helpful realizations for me is that I don't, uh, it's very difficult for me to understand complex things. I don't understand complex things. I can only understand simple things. But I can take simple things and build a simple thing into a module, a block, and then use that block with another simple block and then build stuff on top of that, right? And if I can find patterns, then that makes my life much easier. I don't have to learn X, Y, and Z. I can just learn the, the, an abstract concept of what X, Y, and Z are if they're the same. And we can interpret everything as waves, as analog signals. So a wave has three things that are important. Now, when I say waves, light is a wave. Sound is a wave. Water waves are waves. They all have the same properties. They have absorption, where they absorb and convert from one type of energy to another energy. They have reflection. They have refraction and diffraction. Uh, so a wave has three things. It has the amplitude. So with sound, the amplitude with, uh, amplitude means intensity. So the sound would be how loud it is. That's the amplitude. With light, that's how bright it is. Um, then there's the wavelength, which directly relates to frequency. So a low frequency light would be red light. A high frequency light would be blue light or UV light. With sound, the low frequency is bass. Bass. High frequency is higher sounds. Higher frequency sounds. And there's phase, which is where something is in its, um, in its amplitude, because amplitude is moving up and down. And when we're dealing with computers, we're digitizing things, we're quantizing, which just means our, our microphone, when I'm recording my uh, Metallica CDs, or I'm backing up my Metallica audio, of course, I go into my microphone, let's say, and that has a sample rate. And the sample rate is the number of times per second I could record, or a frame rate. When you're taking a video, then if it's 30 frames per second, that's, that's a sample rate, 30 hertz, 30 times per second. And the bit rate, that's the depth. So that's how much, uh, how much quality or resolution we have. And these are really important factors. Um, also, waves can do very interesting things like interference. So with interference, we can, uh, we can do constructive and destructive interference. So your sound canceling headphones, when you put those on, they have microphones on the outside. So that when you're listening to the Metallica that you ripped, I'm backed up, uh, you hear the outside sound, or, and the microphone takes that outside sound and it inverts the wave. And then it plays it along with Metallica. And those two cancel out. Just like a water wave with a high peak, high amplitude, and a low amplitude, if they hit, they will cancel out. So that's destructive interference. And there's many other places online and on the internet where you can get free tools um, to learn about physics, uh, such as Veritasium's web, the channel. So Veritasium has amazing videos on physics, and there's so many interesting attacks that we can do with light. Uh, here's uh, Newton, actually, designing the cover for Pink Floyd's album, um, Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, I always thought that it was white light going to the prism and then refracting into the rainbow, but we're reverse engineers, so how do we know no, not, how do we know it's the white light going in versus the rainbow going to the prism and converting to white light? We don't really know. That's an interesting property of physics, is that physics, almost everything works in reverse as well. If you have a speaker, then you're playing sound through that speaker. If you have voltage going into the speaker, and that's moving, that's electrons moving through a coil. And every, any moving particle, every moving charged particle has a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is pushing the speaker cone back and forth. That speaker cone is then pushing air back and forth. And that's what the sound is. The sound is the movement of matter. Um, and the reverse is true as well. So if you have a speaker and you have air moving the speaker cone because the speaker's not on, then the speaker is also pushing electrons back and forth, which then produces a voltage in the coil. So every speaker is a microphone. Every microphone is also a speaker. Now, they're really poor quality versions, but it's true. And this is true with LEDs, for example. Every LED can shine light, but if you monitor the LED, you can actually have the light convert to voltage, and you can read light from an LED. Everything works in reverse. It's an important property. Um, and these are ways that we can take advantage of energy and energy conversion and the way that things actually work at a fundamental level. Um, here is a little bit of the electromagnetic spectrum. We can see the different colors, but it's also important to note that, again, things like UV and IR, those are light. 
Radio is also just another type of light. It's just light we can't see. It's a col colors we can't see. Um, FM radio. FM radio is frequency modulation. So when you tune into 102.7, KISS FM, you're listening to 102.7 megahertz on the electromagnetic spectrum. 102.7 megahertz. And now the frequency is modulating. All that means is when, when there's audio, if you have a 10 kilohertz tone, it's a high-pitched tone, that's 102.71. So 102.7 megahertz plus 10 kilohertz. So you, you, your frequency is actually just moving up and down at 10 kilohertz. So you can think of an audio, an audio wave going like this. If we just flip it 90 degrees, then it's actually going like this, the frequency of the uh, spectrum. Amplitude modulation, AM radio, when you listen to 98.7 AM, that's 98.7 kilohertz in the electromagnetic spectrum. And the amplitude is going up and down to the sound. Um, now, you can do some really cool things with light. There's the light commands research um, that people did where they found that if they, sh if they shine a laser at something like a Google uh, Home, they can say, hey, Google, with light. They just modulate the light. They turn it on and off. Or modulation just means turning on and off or oscillating. They turn it on and off to the frequency of sound. And they, if they record their sound, hey, Google, op unlock my door, and they turn that light, that light hitting the microphone is heating up it's absorbing inside of the microphone, the MEMS microphone, and that produces heat. And heat is vibration of particles. And that then microphone then believes that it's hearing sound. So that means you can shine light through a window and trigger, uh, and trigger the Google Home to do things for you. There's also infrared light. Um, this is a Mark Rober did a, a video showing just a thermal camera where he then pressed a pin and heat is constantly transferring. So just by touching these buttons, heat from his finger goes to the button and then leaves a mark. We don't see it with our eyes, but with a thermal camera, like a FLIR camera, you can do that. Ultraviolet, so ultra, uh, from Latin meaning beyond, on the far side of, so it's on the far side of the visible spectrum. Um, Bunny did an amazing example with ultraviolet light where he took a PIC microcontroller that had firmware that he wanted to extract, but the PIC microcontroller had an E-fuse, an electronic fuse that said, do not allow anyone to debug and access memory from this. And he opened it up, he used nitric acid, sulfuric acid, uh, to get to the silicon. He covered up the area other than the electronic fuses, and then he sh shined UV light, which erased it. That's how programmable read-only memory used to work. We would shine UV light to erase it, and then we could program it. Um, then there's radio, which again is just another part of the spectrum. We talked about FM a little bit. We talked about AM. We're all familiar with, say, 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, um, 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. Our microwaves, the microwave that you make popcorn at home, that's actually 2.4 gigahertz. Microwaves and radio are the same exact thing. Uh, there's the Tempest attack. And the NSA found in the 60s, they knew that a CRT monitor, a cathode ray tube, would con constantly emit radio frequency. And that radio frequency, they could hear in an adjacent room, they could essentially listen to the radio frequency and see what's on the monitor. And there are modern attacks like this today that are happening. Um, we talked a little bit about the AM and FM. Um, then electromagnetism, electro from amber, because the Greeks found that when you rub amber with uh, something like fur, uh, they would attract or repel. Uh, and magnetism from magnesian stone, because there's a place called magnesia where they found stone, and the stone was attracted to other magnesian stones. We realized later as magnetism. Um, this was an example project a few years ago called MagSpoop. I was interested in how the mag stripes actually work within our credit cards. Oh, that's loud. And I put my credit card inside of iron oxide filings. Um, and you can actually read the ones and zeros off of my credit card. I, I'm not even sure why I put the electrical tape, because you can just read the credit card number off the bits at the top. And I thought, all right, well, what are all these numbers? And it's a credit card number. There's a CVV. There's actually a separate CVV. There's a written one, and there's one in the MagStripe. Now, we think, all right, well, who uses MagStripes, right? We always chip or NFC. But have you ever put your credit card in, in a MagStripe machine? It's like, hey, there's a, this is a chip card. Well, how does it know there's a chip card? Well, the MagStripe tells it. The MagStripe says, no, there's a chip card. You need higher security. So what happens if you turn that one to a zero and say, no, 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 there's no chip on here. There's no NFC. <laughs> well, uh, it will, this is the device. This is the MagSpoof device. And it just produces a um, magnetic field. And if you turn, I use the chip card. I put the MagStripe data onto this and was then able to make transactions without the chip. So if you just have access to a MagStripe temporarily, you can then convert the chip to a non-chip card. Um, there are some other interesting attacks. Uh, there's sound. There's so many interesting things that we can do with sound. There's audible sound, which is what humans can hear. We can hear 20 to 20 kilohertz 
Uh, I'm a little older. I can maybe hear to 15 kilohertz. Um, if you listen to a lot of music, you probably hear less. Uh, Berkeley had some amazing research where they used a microphone to listen to the to the sound from a keyboard. And there's a lot of research that I was able to fortunately take advantage of um, in using other people's tools and research to learn how, how, how can I understand what's happening on a keyboard. I, there's something really interesting about all the information that we are constantly inputting. Maybe that's because I'm on a computer every single day typing. Uh, I think it's cool to know that what, what am I typing? What can someone figure out um, if, if some, what someone else is typing? And they're able to just have a microphone, listen to what the sound your computer is making, and convert that back to keys. Um, ultrasound, again, ultra on the far side of. Uh, the University of Tel Aviv had some awesome research where they were using a microphone from a standard cell phone. And they would listen to the ultrasound coming from your computer. As your computer is performing encryption operation, let's say it's using RSA. RSA, if you're encrypting a one bit versus zero bit, it takes different operations. It might do a multiplication followed by a modulo or an exponent followed by a modulo versus a multiplication. And because of those different operations take different amounts of power, that's different amounts of power going through capacitors and inductors of the CPU. Those capacitors and inductors are producing all of these charged particles, all these electrons moving are, is producing magnetism. That magnetism is then moving things on your CPU. So these actual caps are moving within are within your CPU, and they're producing ultrasound because they're moving at a frequency higher than we can hear, above 20 kilohertz. So if you can hear that with a microphone in a lab environment, then you can convert that back to ones and zeros and extract secret keys. Um, pretty amazing stuff. All of this is really just energy conversion. Everything that's happening is a conversion of energy, and that's really interesting. Um, so how can we take advantage of energy conversion? And I started to get interested in laser microphones. So I saw a talk 15 years ago here at DEF CON, and it was incredible. It was about uh, how to use a laser microphone. Now, the first laser microphone, not really a laser microphone, was really just, but a microphone that was, let's say, passive, was from Leon Theremin. If you're familiar with the Theremin instrument, um, Leon Theremin created this Theremin instrument. He was an engineer and physicist. He also created something called The Thing. And he gave this to our friends at the KGB. And the thing was a passive device. Many of us are familiar with RFID devices. They're passive cards, and they go into a field, an RFID field from, say, a reader. And that reader emanates radio. And then that energizes the card. The card now has enough power that it can run a little processor and respond. Once it gets back, this was the first implementation of RFID. And instead of a card with an ID, <laughs> he put in a microphone. And that microphone then went into a seal. And this was a gift that the Soviet, Soviet Union gave to the US ambassador in, the in 1945. They put that, no battery, right? No battery at all. Um, because Leon Theremin realized that he could passively power things. He could power things from far and then get information back. Um, it was many years before the US realized that there was a microphone. Whenever that they were being powered from the outside, they could get audio back. Now, laser microphones is a way of using light in order to listen to sound. So if I can shine a light at a window, and the window, now sound, sound is the vibration of matter, typically air, right? We're typically listening to air, but you can have sound go through solid materials. You can have sound go through water, liquids. Um, and you don't actually need a laser. You just need light. And the light can be visible or invisible, as long as we have a way to receive it. So it was this talk, Sniffing Keystrokes with Lasers and Voltmeters, by Andrea Bar Barasani and Danielle Bianco um, at DEF CON 17. And this really blew my mind. What they were able to do was they were able to point a red laser at a reflective part of a laptop within a room and then pick up the reflection on a photodiode or photoresistor. And they picked it up, they plugged that into their sound card, and they were able to listen to the keystrokes. Now, it took a lot of work. Definitely a proof of concept, but absolutely incredible. Um, and I've always been interested in, th in these keyboards. Uh, a few years ago, I had released a project called Keysweeper. Keysweeper is just an uh, Arduino-based device that you, that's inside of a USB charger. You plug the USB charger into the wall, and it's just sniffing every Microsoft wireless keyboard in the vicinity. It also has a GSM chip, so it's actually connected to a cell phone network. It has a battery inside, so if it gets pulled out, it continues to operate. And then you can inject keystrokes, and you can listen to all keyboards in the vicinity. Um, fortunately, the FBI released a notice to the industry saying, watch out for these keysweeper devices. 
And I read that someone sent that to me, and, they, and I read it said, limit which outlets are available for device charging. Um, some suggestions just for all of us. Uh, know which chargers are currently being used. R immediately remove an unknown chargers um, whenever you see them. I don't think they realize that it's really just the circuitry inside the charger. The charger was just to be clandestine. So you could put it in a banana, at which point you would have to limit which bananas are available for device. You have to know whose bananas are currently being used and immediate removal of any unknown bananas from the office. So beware of bananas and USB chargers. But keystrokes. So these guys demonstrated the components that they used, um, common laser, like off-the-shelf laser, a resistor, a battery. And this was their schematic. So what they did was they had the laser hit a laptop, it would reflect off the laptop, and then it would go into a photodiode or a photoresistor. They would power that and they would go into the microphone. And the reason for the microphone is that that's an analog to digital converter. That can convert the actual light waves. So the photodiode converts the light waves to an, uh, electricity. And that electricity is still a wave. It's just like our AC. So our AC that's producing 120 volts RMS voltage um, in the wall, that's traveling at 60 hertz, 60 times per second, is moving up and down. Um, and you can actually take advantage of that. Uh, there was a, I was curious actually whether it really was 60 hertz. Um, so I had, con I had connected a, a transformer to my AC line and converted that 120 volts down to 12 volts. And then I measured the zero crossing every time it would cross zero. Because I was curious, it says 60 hertz. Is that, does that actually mean 60 times per second? Or does it mean like between 59 and 61? And I found the 60 hertz is more accurate than the clock in my phone. So if my clock in my phone is not on Wi-Fi, this, I can use the 60 hertz from the wall to measure time because it's so accurate. And I didn't understand why is the wall, why is the 60 hertz so accurate? Apparently it's connected to GPS. So if one power station goes down, another sta station can pick it up. But the interesting thing is it's not always accurate. It would actually remain accurate only for a short period of time and then it would drift. And I realized that you can take advantage of that drift and you can exploit that. So what you can do is you can say, if I measure that drift over time, you can take that and use that as a fingerprint of a location because every power station has its own unique fingerprint of that drift. So if you put a Raspberry Pi in a transformer in different power stations, just in the wall, you can have a public database where you're all sending the drift of this information of the 60 hertz signal. And now whenever you have a recording, a video recording or an audio recording, you can perform a match and figure out where that audio recording was taken or where that video recording was taken. Um, just a, another interesting project that we, that we could take advantage of. And there's so much other interesting research in the laser microphone and the keyboard acoustics. Um, ben Nassi, he did lamp phone, glow worm, many other, uh, many other attacks. Um, there's the visual microphone, there's keyboard acoustic side channels, keyboard acoustic emanations. And I wanted to see, A, can I implement this laser microphone, and B, can I, do some, can I have some improvements? And can I also hear sound? I want to hear sound from a window. Now first, it's really, really important. Like, lasers are not a toy. I mean, they're a lot of fun. Cats love them. They're a toy, they're a toy to cats. But you can, um, oh my god, uh, you can burn your eyes. So you do actually want to always use laser safety glasses, um, goggles. When you're buying a five milliwatt laser, it doesn't mean it only outputs five milliwatts. It can output much more power. Um, America, we have the ANSI standard Z136.1. Europe uses EN207. Make sure you're getting a, from a laser safety goggles from a reputable source. Uh, and also for the wavelength, for the color of light that you're working with. Now let's talk about hardware. So I first tried to re-implement the, uh, the original laser microphone. And it took me a while to get it working. And the sound quality wasn't great. Now it was still incredible. Like as soon as you get to hear sound, that you're bouncing off a window and then reflecting back and picking up, and you can hear what's going on inside, it's, it's a really magical feeling. Um, and I want to see, can I improve it? Can I improve the quality? Because it just, it wasn't that great. Um, here's my transmit side. So we've updated the, the system a little bit. Uh, the, the primary things, the primary differences, for one is normally you just have a laser and you point it at the window. Every schematic, every laser microphone I've ever seen simply has a constant laser source hitting something and reflecting back. The problem I found with this is that there's so much noise. We have the 60 hertz noise from the wall. We have all sorts of noise from computers around. And all of this stuff is typically low frequency noise that is messing with your signal. And we need to get rid of that. Um, so I found a laser driver 
uh, this was a, a laser driver I had that, a lot, that had something called an RF bias T. And what this means is it's a mixer. So you can have a constant current source that's powering the laser, and then you can have another source that's oscillating. And I was thinking, well, what, what they do in radio is that they'll oscillate things at different frequencies to get away from other frequencies that might be harming. So what if we turn the laser on and off in the RF domain? If we go into radio, and we're turning that light on and off at the radio frequencies, then we can actually get away from all of that noise that we hear. Um, here you can see the different parts of the system. So the oscilloscope in the top, I use that simply because I have a signal generator built in. Um, it's a Rigel. Uh, I'll have the full, full details, the full bill of, bill of materials um, in, another, in a future slide. But the current controller and temperature controller, you do not need a temperature controller, but that's just what I have at home. Um, current controller for the constant current source. In the top, there's that black box. That's the laser driver. Um, there's all, also the RF mixer built into that. I use a collimating lens. So what collimation means is, collimation means it just takes light and tries to make it into a single dot um, or a, a, a straight, you know, a, if you take a flashlight, you typically have an unfocused beam of light. A collimated beam is a beam that does not focus or defocus. I used to think a laser, what made a laser a laser was that it was collimated, that it was a straight line, and that's not true. It's, it's not collimation. Uh, what makes a laser a laser is that it's coherent. And all that means is that the phase of light coming out is always the same. It always starts at the same place. It's not important for this attack. I uh, just thought something I thought that was interesting for me to understand what a, la what a laser is. The flexure, that just lets us actually, actually direct the light up and down very easily. A shutter is to really tighten our beam. So even though we have a collimation and we're collimating this laser beam, we want to get a really tight beam. So a shutter just lets us close that, close that even further. Um, and behind the lens, there's a laser diode. And all of these you can buy separately. And the nice thing is that with a laser diode, I can use a red light normally when testing, but then I can move to the infrared where we don't see it. Um, so this is, these are the actual components I'm using. Um, the obligatory uh, turn on the fog and check out the cool red laser beam. Uh, then we want to actually receive that information. So how do we receive it? The typical setup is we have a photodiode and a sound card. But what we're doing is we're modulating. So with the signal generator, we start modulating this thing at hundreds of times, uh, hundreds of thousands of times per second. So the sound, humans can hear between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. So I want that sound. The, but I want to then get away from that, those low frequencies because there's so much electromagnetism at those frequencies that it's disrupting the signal I'm getting. Because we're getting very little light back from the laser that's reflecting off a, uh, off a window or, or off a computer. Um, so first, and the sound card can only listen to, say, 48 kilohertz or 192 kilohertz. To get away from all that sound, we modulate the laser. We turn the laser on and off 400,000 times per second. So that we're at 400 kilohertz. So we need something other than a sound card that can actually accept this. Um, so first, I thought, okay, well, I can use a bunch of analog components. The problem with analog components and electronic circuitry is it's a huge pain. So as you're putting these little components in a circuit board, for one, you're dealing with high frequencies. So as you're trying to change all, as you're trying different filters and amplifiers, all of this is very difficult. And think, man, I really wish I could use GNU Radio. GNU Radio is open source signal processing software. And with that, then I can drag and drop, and life is just great. I can like sit back in my chair, drink some caffeine, and just play with these locks, and just test different things to see what works. The problem, the, the challenge with using GNU Radio is that I need then a software-defined radio to pull that data in. The sound card won't work, because I need something that can listen to not only 400 kilohertz, I need to go at least double that. It's called Nyquist theorem. I need to go to at least 800 kilohertz of a sample rate, how fast I'm listening to that data. And I can use a software-defined radio, but software-defined radios don't ever go that low. So the RTL SDR, I'm not sure where that goes, maybe 100 megahertz, excuse me. Um, the HackRF, amazing, I love the HackRF, but it, oh, it, the minimum frequency it can listen to uh, is at about, oh, let's see, one megahertz, one megahertz, and we're at 400 kilohertz. The USRP, it also has a very low uh, bit rate, so it's about, uh, the analog to digital converter has an eight bit sample rate, and we want higher samples, we want higher resolution, so we can extract more signal. Um, the USRP B210 has 12 bits, which is good, but it requires 70 megahertz, and we're just down at four, 400 kilohertz. Uh, but then I started looking, and there is something called an up converter that we can get. So the up converter actually adds 125 megahertz to a signal as long as it's at least 100 kilohertz. So we're at 400 kilohertz. So ultimately, what I used was a photodiode. I go into an amplifier. That amplifier then goes into a Hammett up 
V2. That adds 125 megahertz to our 400 kilohertz. So now we're 125.4 uh, megahertz. Then I go into the USRP. Um, now that can go into my computer. Here's the, the physical setup. This is the receive, receiving side. Lens to capture light into a photodiode, into the amp, into the USRP B2, B210, uh, into the computer. Um, if you see this outside of your window, <laughs> it's <is> super sketchy. <laughs> Maybe like shut the blinds, <laughs> call the police. But once you actually point this laser at a computer, uh, now there are some big challenges here. Actually performing alignment is very, very, very challenging. Getting sound is actually not so challenging because our ears, we're pretty good at listening to just one kilohertz of sound. Although we can hear up to 20 kilohertz, just one kilohertz, we can usually make out what someone is saying. Um, getting above, I'd say, four kil, like the best I was able to get above was four to five kilohertz of sound. And I found for keystroke extraction, I needed to get to three kilohertz. If I got to 2.5 kilohertz, I could not convert anything to keystrokes. If I got to three kilohertz, I could start converting to keystrokes. Um, here's the hard hardware on the transmit side, just the actual components, just so you know. Uh, here is the RX side. This will all be online, so if you want to know the exact components I used. And one of the other improvements that I want to make here, for one, now that we're getting into the RF domain, we get away from all this noise, and we can actually filter out that noise. Another cool thing is I wanted to do this in infrared. I don't want someone seeing a la me standing outside pointing a laser into their window. That's just too obvious. Um, so I got an infrared laser diode, and how do I actually align to the infrared? Because I can't see it. So I got this infrared camera. Um, it's the x Knight USB 2S. M. It's around $120. It's very cool. It's actually very exciting to be able to see infrared just in, around you. And here's a, it's hard, to, maybe hard to tell, but I have the laser diode going and hitting, a, just hitting a white square, and you can't see it on my camera, my phone camera, because my phone camera also can't see IR, and my eyes can't see IR. And then here's, just so we can see, uh, I made a recording with that camera pointing the laser at my laptop, and you can kind of see the reflection. I'm sitting below the, uh, the laptop with a steam iron, and I'm just like steaming my laptop until, I think it was the first time I ever used a steam iron, until boiling water boiled down on me, and I was like, ah, so I got maybe a few seconds before I burnt myself. But while I was doing this testing, I also saw th something else interesting. I had pulled out my phone, and um, I wanted to change the song because Spotify was playing. And when I unlocked my phone, I saw these dots, not on the wall, but I saw it on the IR, on the IR recording. I'm like, wait, wh what's happening? When my phone, when I pulled out my phone, I realized this is LiDAR. So my phone is using LiDAR on the back. I'm like, why? Why is it projecting all of these infrared dots that we cannot see with our eyes? And it only happens when the camera app is open. And it's, it's actually very cool. It's figuring out how far is the object, how far is it? And if it's close, it's gonna use the close camera. You have a bunch of cameras on the back of your phone. So it's deciding which camera to use. So when you go closer to an object, it will automatically switch to a different, different camera. And I thought, well, that's really cool, but what if I can actually measure this? So I put this in my spectrometer just to see what, what uh, wavelength of infrared this was, because now we can just monitor for this wavelength of light. So imagine you have a little device with a photodiode, a, photo, uh, a photo sensor on you, so that whenever someone points their phone camera at you, you get a little vibration because you can just measure for that frequency of light and for that on and off path. And now you can know when someone points their phone camera at you before they're even recording. And it only will show, you can see that's that sort of rectangle, that's exactly the same path. That means I could just make all of you vibrate right now. How, how fun would that be? So separate project, we'll do that another time. So there's the RF modulation. This is the biggest improvement that I've seen um, in this laser microphone. So actually getting into the RF domain um, the photodiode I use, this is the Spot 2D. It's pretty interesting, it, has actually, it actually has two cells. So where photodiodes are typically one pixel, this is really two pixels. The hardest challenge, the biggest challenge of this whole system is that you must get essentially to the edge of the diode. You don't want to get the light in the center, you want to get to the edge. Because as soon as the edge, you essentially want your light, your reflection to go on and off that diode. If you're in the center, then you're just gonna, you're not gonna get much variation. But if you're at the edge, that's where you get all the variation. Um, there, I noticed there was a hair in, in their photo. Fortunately, there was no hair in the photo diode they sent me, so I didn't have to send it back. Um, and then there's the software that we use. So we use some awesome software. First, GNU Radio. And we'll, we'll quickly go through the steps here, but all of this will be online as well. 
Um, so GNU Radio, all the red stuff on the left, we can, those are just variables. That just makes it easier for me to, uh, just like in software, to use a single variable that will change things in multiple areas. The things uh, circled in blue, those are just GUI, those are just uh, graphical syncs so we can see information. Um, the heart of it, the heart of the GNU Radio stuff is first we start with our US, USRP source. So this pulls in data at a sample rate of 4.8 megahertz or mega samples per second. Our center frequency is 125.2 megahertz. So 125 megahertz because of the RF up converter, the Hammond up, and then 200 kilohertz. Now we're actually modulating at 400 kilohertz, but we don't want to listen at 400 kilohertz because there's something called the DC spike. Any software defined radio is going to give you this giant DC spike and you want to move away from that and then you filter out that DC spike and then you can listen to the actual data you want. Um, we mentioned a couple different SDRs. The ch reason I chose the B210 was because it had a high resolution or bit rate and it had a high sample rate. Um, you can also use a Salier logic analyzer. I realize this is also actually a pretty nice, it's 50, me 50 mega samples per second is also 12 bits. Um, then we go into a translating FIR filter. This is a three things. First, it's a bandpass filter. Um, oh, first it actually changes the, the frequency you're at. So we want to go from 125.2 to 125.4. That's where our sound is. So now we're centered on the sound. And the sound is moving up and down. So our signal is some sort of sound wave, but our amplitude modulated signal is at 400 kilohertz. So it's going up and down. So the FIR filter will also then do a bandpass. So now we're saying I only want what's around the 400 megahertz. Or, or excuse me, 400 killers. Everything else we can ignore. So we band pass that out and then we decimate. Decimate just brings, we bring the sample rate down to a more usable sample rate. Then we go into and we um, amplitude demodulate. So we convert the AM to the back into the actual sound. So now we can hear sound and then we save the file. Then we use something called Isotope RX. This is absolutely incredible software. It's commercial software, but it's very good. Um, it's great at spectral repair and it gives you a spectrograph so you can actually see what's happening inside of your signal. And then you can do all sorts of things like DS, DHUM, DSplosive. I have no idea what DSplosive is. Uh, but it has a lot of ways that you can then improve the signal. So you can say, hey, I want to learn this area of sound where there's just a lot of noise. Learn that and now apply it to the rest of the signal and remove that noise. Um, FFmpeg, just so we can actually convert some things around. And then key tap three is really the heart of the system for the keystroke extraction. We want to know what the person is typing. And uh, I like this guy's GitHub. He says, I like big VMRC and I cannot lie. Um, so key tap three is part of this software where he takes audio and he's able to then separate out the keystrokes. Now what's interesting is that when you have a keyboard and you press some keys on it, every key produces a unique sound. Now we're not recording sound, we're recording vibration because we're hitting the laptop and reflecting off. And when someone's typing on that laptop, the sound is just vibration and vibration matter. So the laptop is vibrating. It's literally vibrating. And because every unique key has a position, just like if you hit a drum, if you take a drum and you hit it in one location, you're producing one sound. If you hit it some, slightly somewhere else, you produce a slightly different sound. You can record that and you can differentiate those two sounds. Then you can figure out where they've actually hit. Now on a keyboard, you don't know what they're typing. You don't actually know what they're hitting. But if you've collected over 100 or 200 keystrokes and you know the language they're typing in, then you can perform analysis and say, and frequency analysis, like what are they actually typing? This is a Zodiac killer. So he would release uh, these puzzles that are essentially substitution ciphers. Um, you can take all encryption and break it down into substitution cipher and uh, transposition cipher. Um, uh, just some example, I love the outdoors, uh, so going in, in as well as pointing lasers. So a couple demonstrations of the setup. Here we can see what this actually looks like um, as you're pointing the laser onto a reflective surface of a laptop. Um, we'll just see the KeyTap software, FFmpeg and KeyTap running. This is at 10x speed. Going to be very hard to see, but the next slide I will do a little screenshot so we can compare. Um, Again, that's 10x speed. So here's typing on a keyboard, what I typed, and then what KeyTab3 was able to recover. This is after going through the setup, after going through GNU Radio, then Isotope RX with a lot of cleanup. Again, I needed to co collect at least three kilohertz of sound, and also just an example of what the sound uh, actually sounds like. This was playing music inside of a room and then reflecting off the window. Oh. 
Um, and you can hear a little bit of that sound. And that is the project. Um, the challenges, I mean, this is really interesting. How do you get rid of noise? The, this whole thing was really a, a signal processing. And the improvements to the laser microphone, the biggest thing to the laser microphone was really getting outside of the sound domain, getting into the radio domain. Once you get into there, then you have a lot more processing capabilities and you have all the sound, a ton of noise that was there um, is gone. And there are plenty of improvements we can make, um, we can discuss later, but uh, thank you so much. I appreciate your time.